we see in our society is a blatant flouting of God's law, of God's word, a, a, a deliberate ignorance of the standards and the purpose of God. So the prevailing philosophy of the world in which we live is man-centred, self-centred, independent, and it's called humanism. It's a humanistic time in which we live. That is, man has declared himself to be God and God as being irrelevant. That's the prevailing perspective in our society today. You just try telling the media any different, you try telling most people in our society any different and you'll find that you're against the flow. The, so that prevailing philosophy is humanistic. Our institutions, even our churches, have been strongly influenced by this philosophy. I understand we're in a Seventh-day Adventist church today and I would suggest that even they have been influenced by the philosophy of the world. It is almost impossible not to be. We haven't got time to explore all of that today, but just, just believe me. As a result, most Christians think from a humanistic base and will continue to do so until they're convicted by the Holy Spirit of the error of their ways. It was an extraordinary painful experience when I was teaching at a classroom and writing some information on the board. We used to have blackboards in those days and chalk. I think blackboards and chalk are absolutely fantastic. This other modern stuff, forget it. It's hopeless. Blackboards and chalk are interactive. You actually write on the board. People can see you writing. It's part of who you are. Does that date me at all? Well, it may do, but I tell you what, it's far better. These, uh, have you got one of these? Yeah, these things. <laughs> Forget it. They are a distraction to the main game. But uh, that's another theory that I'll, I won't pursue today. So, we, what I was talking about something. What was I talking about, John? He was speaking to me about education. And uh, God speaks to some people, you know. And he said, who do you suppose created that knowledge? Immediately, I knew the answer. Not a problem. I had never asked the question. It had never occurred to me. And I was um, probably in my fifth or sixth year of teaching at the time. And it seemed as though I was stuck at the blackboard for hours whilst God does something in your head. He does all that sort of stuff in a fraction of a second, incidentally. And, and we moved on in the lesson. And I couldn't, I couldn't escape that. God had done something, transformed my, my understanding and thinking. So then I began, as I began continuing to read the scripture, of course, it began to be obvious what had happened. And I began researching the whole thing and I discovered that my whole mind was screwed up, that I thought from man's standards rather than God's. And I'm still in the process of changing my mind by the power of God to think God's thoughts after him, to think the way that God thinks, to think in terms of his standards as a presupposition so that I don't go through this whole process of getting in a situation and I... I make all sorts of decisions in this situation as to what I should be doing and where I'm going and I get a couple of days down the track and God says, where are you going? And you realise, oh, whoops, I have not given God reference in this. I'm not thinking from his standards and perspectives. I'm thinking from a humanistic standard. So I'm creating problems for myself. Well, that's the journey that every one of us are on. If you didn't want to be a philosopher, I'm sorry, you need to be. If you didn't want to be a theologian, I'm sorry, you need to be. Every one of us should be an amateur theologian and an amateur philosopher. In other words, we need to think in life. We need to think about what we're doing. Please don't tell me you don't have a brain. Every one of us had. I can tell by the shape of your head you've got a brain in there. And all you need to do is use it regularly. You don't need to have a high IQ. Please, please understand me. You don't need to have a high IQ. That's why God chose me for this call, for this purpose. I don't have a high IQ. There are plenty of people around the place a lot smarter than I am, but I find that I embarrass them terribly. Not because I'm smarter, but because God has changed some things in my understanding and thinking. 
and he will do for all of us as we get into his word, as we spend time with him in terms of our homeschooling processes. We find it's God who's the key. He wants to change the way that we think. So the fundamental principle is that Christians should always begin with God. Let me look at the clock. Okay, we're doing very badly. Christians should always begin with God and the Bible. That is, we understand, we, we under the Holy Spirit learn to think God's thoughts after him and we make our decisions on that basis. I said that before. When we embark on Christian homeschooling, we enter a new and a different world, one in which the Bible is paramount, where God's standards are important. Are they, they're the defining standards of our lives. This brings us into contrast with the world and ultimately into conflict with the world because it is going in a different direction, not a little bit different, 180 degrees different to the way that God has called us to go in life. That's why we're going against the flow, not because we want to, not because we enjoy it, not because we want to be a martyr, but because that's the way God will lead us. The important issue is how do I adjust to that without becoming perverted and twisted in my thinking. You know, the whole world's against me, but nevertheless, there's still me here battling on for you, Lord. No, no, you're never going to make it with that sort of thinking. It's always the thinking, God, I'm just wanting to be obedient to you and to walk with you, and you will provide the way. I understand the rest of the world is going in a different direction, but I don't need to take up the antagonism toward those people. Are you with me? You can be consumed with antagonism toward the world and the way that it's going. You're meant to be consumed with God and the wonder of his person and just walk in obedience to him. Just get used to being, used to being the person who's out of step, who's all alone. But don't be like Elijah who says, I'm the only one left. You're not. There are many, many, many others. It's just that you don't know a lot of them. Okay? Important that we don't become antagonistic. Okay, now the contrast in your notes there. The state's legislation for education, this is to help explain a little bit. The state's legislation for education presumes that children belong to the state. It's very important that we understand that. You think that your children belong to you. The state thinks your children belong to them. Okay, now if you don't believe that, just go talk to your local politician. Almost without exception, they will tell you. No, 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 the state has a compelling interest in your children. What do they mean by a compelling interest? They mean ownership. That's why we have compulsory schooling. You with me? It's got nothing to do with the government. It's got to do with you and God, how your children are educated, whether they're educated, whether they're educated poorly or otherwise. It's to do with you and God. It's not nothing to do with the state. They have interposed themselves on that and passed legislation to ensure that you comply with their expectations. So you don't send your child to school, what happens? You will be prosecuted. You have to ask the government for exemption from the Act to be able to homeschool. Right? So you're coming under their authority in the process. Now, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't necessarily, I'm just saying that's the way it is. And just by, by the way, there are a number of people who don't register. Did you know that? So if there are 3,000 homeschoolers registered in Victoria, there's probably 6,000 altogether, families that is. I don't know about that. Just, just a thought that crossed my mind momentarily. And you might like to think about it too. So the state's role then is to equip your children to be citizens of the state. God's role is that you should equip your children to be citizens of the kingdom of God. Now they will also be part of the state. I prefer the word subject to citizen. Citizen is a, an American idea. Subject is an English idea flows out of the system of government that we have, that we are subjects of Her Majesty, you see. Do you like that idea? Because Her Majesty is coronated. What's it, what's it called? Does that, that do us? 
brought into office under the lordship of Jesus Christ. She acknowledges that. And we are her subjects under her authority. But her authority is to do the will of God. Right? It's the same thing with the Westminster system of government that we have in Australia. We have people called ministers in the government. And those ministers are called ministers for the reason that they are to be servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and servants of his people. They don't quite understand that, you see. They think that Parliament is sovereign, that is, Parliament is the highest level of authority. But Parliament operates under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the King. That's the way our system is designed to operate. That's why Her Majesty is the head of government or the head of state. And she has her representative in Australia, but that's another story that we haven't got time to go into today. All of that to say that the way that the modern state operates is quite opposite to the way that it's meant to operate according to our current documentation so that you find people telling us that we are a democracy. Australia is not, never has been a democracy. It's a constitutional monarchy, which is totally different. If we had time, we could explain all that stuff too. So, it's possible that as parents, you're not keen to raise your children to the standards of the state. You may prefer to be raising your children according to the standards and the purposes of God. And it may be that you're homeschooling your children to protect your children from the influences of the state. Now, the state authorities have no conception of that. They cannot conceive that anybody would want to train their children to avoid the influence of the state. They, they think that they are God on earth. And of course you'd want to do what they want you to do. So the tentacles of the state in interfering with the family, life and education are ever increasing. And for most authorities, as I've said, it is inconceivable that you're actually trying to protect your children from them. As Ronald Reagan famously said, the most dangerous words you can hear are, I'm from the government, I've come to help you. Yes, and, and I'm not trying to be smart or antagonistic, just that we understand these principles. However, we need to be, take care not to be antagonistic toward the authorities, but we do need to be sure that we understand that we're training our children according to God's ways and not according to the state. And that may well create a conflict between you and the representative of the state with whom you interact. And you need a lot of wisdom to know how to handle that situation. The state wants to train children as citizens of the state, with all that means, whereas biblical Christians want to train their children in the ways of the Lord. The Christian, number two, the Christian believes that children are entrusted to us by the Lord. Parents are to train and nurture their children in the ways of the Lord so that they can effectively serve him in building his kingdom on earth. That's why Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's the introduction. First thing he says is, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what you're about in homeschooling. The kingdom of God came with Jesus Christ when he came to the earth. And if your theology doesn't fit that, that's okay. But that's what it says here. Your will be done. In other words, there is authority for the will of God to be done here on earth as it is in heaven, by virtue of the Lord Jesus coming, dying on a cross, paying the price for sin and rising again in power. And it's that power that he has given to us. That's the life that saves us, the life of Christ that saves us. It's his power working in us. It's God coming to indwell us. The most incredible privilege a human being can have is that God would come and invest himself in our lives and give us the power to live in him, to be obedient to him, to serve him with all our hearts. It's a wonderful privilege. Further, parents have a specific task to perform to and for their children. The Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he will not depart from it. 
This is not so much a promise as an instruction to us. You cannot guarantee what your child's journey in life is going to be, but you certainly are responsible to train them. I have a lot of theories in that area, most of which have been proven incorrect, but they're good theories nevertheless. <coughs> If you will train your child in the ways of God, God will watch over your child. The problem is, by the time you figure out what are the ways of God, your children are usually grown up. And you've made so many mistakes on the way that you may pay a price for some of those mistakes. Now, don't see that as negative. That's God's designed it that way, folks. He's designed it that way so that the just shall live by faith. You see, when you're raising your kids, who knows what you're supposed to do in every situation? Anyone here? Anyone got it all figured out? Something happens, know exactly what to do here. <laughs> we get in situations, <laughs> what do you do now? What do you, how do you deal with this situation? Well, you don't have a clue, but he does. And the connection between you and him is by faith. The just shall live by faith. I think I began to understand that as our children got to teenage years. And so I said, you don't necessarily need to do this. You may find this is almost blasphemous, but it's not. I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing here. I, I really don't. Sometimes I think I've got it all figured out. But then something crops up. What do you do now? Panic. No, 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 no. You say, God, you indwell me. Your Holy Spirit lives in me for a purpose. I'm going to trust you by faith that when a situation like this crops up, what do you do now? I'm going to trust you that the first thought that pops into my tiny mind is the Holy Spirit. A bit risky, isn't it? I'm not sure there's any other way, though, quite frankly, because God's called us to live by faith. Faith that he's in control. Faith that he knows what he's about. Faith that he cares about me. Faith that he has a plan for my life and he has a plan for my children's life. Faith that he has put me in charge of this situation and he won't leave me. He won't leave me to my own devices. He will give me the wisdom. I'm trusting him to do that. So I'm going to speak it out. And I've told the story a thousand times before but when my son was about 14 or 15, we're getting ready for church one morning and he says, I don't want to go to church anymore. I'm the pastor, you see. And at that point, I'm likely to blow a fuse. But we had this deal, you see. And before I had a chance to blow a fuse, out of my mouth comes, Frogley's go to church. And I, I couldn't believe what I was saying. I thought, what was the point of saying that? But it just phew, solved the whole problem. I couldn't believe it. It's amazing. See, what I was saying effectively, or what the Holy Spirit, I think, was saying through me, was, son, your identity is in Christ. And because of that, we go to church. It's not even a debate. It's not a question. That's a fact. That's a reality of the matter. That's who we are. God will give us wisdom in those situations. Now, sometimes we won't hear him pro properly. Sometimes our emotions will get in the way. But as we trust him, he will teach us how to hear the direction of the Holy Spirit and how to act with him. Because you don't have time often to sit and think for a couple of days about what the answer is. You need to do something right then. And God will show you if you trust him because he's, he's committed to you. He's committed to your family. You belong to him. That's your identity. Trust him. Have confidence in him. Boldness in him. Then it goes on in the Ephesians and it says, And you fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. It's got nothing to do with fathers teasing their children. Got that? Ladies, my wife will tell you that's a problem. No, it's not. That's not the issue. The issue is don't provoke your children to wrath. Listen to what it goes on to say. But 
instead of provoking them to wrath, wrath, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. In other words, it's our responsibility to teach children where they're going, what the standards are, what the Lord has said, what we as a family are about, and to walk in obedience with that. If you don't set those standards, you cause enormous frustration for children and for anyone else for that matter. If you find yourself in a situation where there's no standard, you will find yourself frustrated. It would be the same thing this morning here if we all just sat around in the hall and nothing happened. There was no instruction. There was no one doing anything. Sooner or later, all of us would be saying, what are we supposed to do here? What's the deal? Is it lunchtime? Is it morning tea time? Is there going to be someone? What's going to happen? If we don't tell anyone, it brings all that uncertainty. And that's where most kids are. Most teenagers are because nobody has given them instruction. This is the way to go. But you see, you're not allowed to do that because every child needs to make his own decision. He needs to decide for himself what he wants to do. No, 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 no. That's the world. God tells you what to do. He's very prescriptive, very clear. And that's our role as parents too, of course, with our children. Okay, moving along then to isolated, which is just a heading. It doesn't mean anything. It's just there. Christian parents, when setting out on this course, find themselves working to combat the alien ideas of the state that are pervasive in our community and often find themselves not only feeling isolated but actually being victimised. Some of you may have felt that. For that reason, we can... We can uh, Oh, very. This, this, I don't know who wrote these notes. For that reason, it's very helpful to find like-minded people that we can relate to. Louise was just mentioning that as we started this morning. We need to have like-minded people around us because we often have difficulty really um, being sure that God is saying to us what we think he's saying. It's nice to ask somebody else, how do you, how do you get on with this? What do you think God's saying about this situation or that situation? It's very important to have those sort of relationships and God has designed us for that. Sometimes, perhaps the biggest challenge many homeschool parents find is with their church where leaders don't have an understanding of the need to train children in God's ways. Thus, the very place they should go to be able to have spiritual support and encouragement is denied them. I would say probably 80% of homeschoolers struggle in this area where they find themselves isolated in terms of their own church people. There are so many other people in the church that are antagonistic to what they're doing because they don't understand what's going on or the purpose for it or what it's really meant to be. You may or may not have that situation. If you don't, you should be very thankful for that because it is commonly the case in so many churches. And that's because um, so many pastors don't really understand the importance of training children. And you'll notice if you look at most Sunday school programs that they are simply telling of stories from the Old Testament or from Jesus' life that are, and in which the story is the important part but the spiritual truth is often either very superficial or even glossed over. So in terms of children being trained in the scriptures, it's very seldom that that happens even in Sunday schools in churches today. But that's another point to look at. The sense of isolation can be a problem as we tend to develop a fortress mentality which can isolate us from the very people to whom we're called to provide a testimony. And the issue can become a significant ne negative in our attempts to raise a godly family. In other words, it's, at some stage or other, we as people and as families need to act with the big bad world out there. And if we... If we develop too much of a fortress mentality, then we find that we're unable to do that effectively because they're the people that need to hear gospel as well. And we need to have, there needs to be a bridge for us to build for those folks to be able to find the truth. All right, can we move on then to cross the page there? Uh, I just made some comments there about... Um, the humanist opposition and how it manifests itself. There are certain European nations, Germany for example, where homeschooling is completely outlawed. You're not allowed to do homeschooling and uh, uh, really quite an offensive program. And Australian governments have worked enthusiastically for many years to make homeschooling more difficult 
because of the prevailing belief that everyone should be treated equally and have the same benefits as everybody else. Now, we often have difficulty looking at our situation from their perspective, from the world's perspective. You see, the, the, the world and the government sees that its role is to, um, <laughs> some of them see it as to, to guide the nation and to make the nation um, one. What's the word? Homogeneous or something or other. Um, that we're all loving people together and uh, we need to have all our things in common and, uh, and be able to work together. But you Christians are exclusive. You, you create problems. You know, Christians say that there are people who are going to be saved and there are people that are going to be lost. That's discriminatory. That's exclusivity. That's not tolerance. That's not understanding. We don't want to have a world like that. We don't want you to be training your children in that idea of exclusivity. We want you to be part of the community in which we live. So this is the mindset of these people. They're not trying to be vindictive. They really believe that this is so important. And there's a sense in which all of us would believe that. Except that we know that our faith will separate us from those who are antagonistic to God. And it's a significant <coughs> gulf. You can't, you can't remove that gulf. It's huge. So that will always be the case. And what the humanists are trying to do is to overcome that problem by their methodology. The only way to overcome the problem is through Christ and dealing with sin. But you see, they can't understand that. And so from their perspective, what they're presenting is quite logical. We need to understand that so that we understand what we're against as we're raising our children for God and trying to raise our families in a godly fashion. So it's not any surprise that the government is constantly at work trying to make homeschooling more difficult to us because what they're wanting to do is make you like the rest of the community. And what you're saying is, no, we don't want to be like that. But you see, for them, that's like a red rag. What it's saying is, you're un-Australian. You don't want to be part of Australia. You want to be some, some queer lot, peculiar lot. We really don't have a lot of time for that sort of thing in this nation. So we're going to put requirements down, like a national curriculum, like this is what you have to teach. We don't want too much of the religion stuff in your program because, you see, that, that separates you from the rest of society. That makes you unusual. And we don't want you to be unusual. We want you to be like us. But, you see, I don't want to be like them. You probably don't want to be like them either. So there's a problem. That's the against the flow thing. That's the issue that we're up against all the time in our homeschooling and our training of our children. So um, I've made mention there of what's happening in Queensland um, and it happens. it's happening in other states increasingly, particularly with the ACE program, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> many Queensland homeschoolers because the Queensland government has in past years been significantly more difficult than uh, most of the other states. And so parents, to avoid having an inspector come and put um, draconian expectations on them as homeschoolers, and they were expecting homeschoolers to produce documentation about their students' work the same as they would expect from a trained school teacher. And for most homeschoolers, they say, I haven't got a clue. I haven't got a clue either. When I taught, we didn't do all that nonsense. We just taught children and marked their work and gave them exams and saw to it that they were succeeding in their work. But now you have to be a psychologist and you have to have, fill out multitudes of forms to cover your backside as well as various other things on the way through. <clears throat> So what people have been doing, or what, what Christian schools have been doing, is setting up a distance education department at which, into which homeschoolers can enrol their children and then they don't have to worry about asking for an exemption because they're out of school. But now the government is saying, aha, we're aware of this, this is a bit tricky. You Christians are very tricky people, not very nice people to deal with. Now, if you're enrolled in this school... You have to be at the school physically for X number of days a year. 
because you're enrolled at the school, come on, if you're enrolled at the school, you should be attending the school. So <laughs> we've got people who are hundreds of kilometres away from the school they're enrolled in, and yet they have to bring their kid down to the school for a week or whatever the case, once or twice or however many times a year. So it's, it's going to get worse and worse on that basis. But you can understand their logic. right? It's just that we don't agree with it. What, we're to, what we were trying to do, what Christians are trying to do, is to avoid the legislation. Sometimes it's better to hit it head on. But you do need to be wise about that. Very, very, very wise. There's no point losing your children. No point going to jail, ultimately. But it may have to happen. It's just that if and when it does, you need to know that it's God's direction for you at that time. Hopefully that won't happen and um, you know, maybe God will be gracious to us and we'll, we'll see a change of direction. Okay, now defining the battlefield as we uh, wrap up, the time has almost gone as it usually has. Before embarking on this momentous journey of home education, it's wise to consider the foundational issues. Now the nature of man, who is man? I'll let you read that in your own time and ponder it. The nature of the family... We don't understand the nature of man, the nature of the family. We're in trouble. We, we've got no back, back information for what we're doing and why and how and the direction in which we should go. And thirdly, the role and responsibility of the state. The state is God's creation to set a standard through which it maintains the well-being and protects its citizens. That's about all that it's required to do. And that's what we read about in Romans 13, and I've just highlighted the critical passages or the critical phrases in that passage of scripture there for you. That every soul be subject to governing authorities. Why? Because those authorities are appointed by God. What are they supposed to do? They are to be ministers of God to do you good. Who defines what good is? God does. This is his book. Right? So they're not there to do anything against biblical principles. Okay? If you do evil in terms of what God says, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. So the, the state is to be the minister of justice in society. Right? That's God's appointment of them. So if you do something wrong, you don't go to the church court, you go to the state court. If you rob a bank or murder somebody or steal something, you don't go to a church court, you go to the state court and they have the authority under God and they should penalise you according to the standards of God found in the word of God, which they don't, of course, and that's why our justice system doesn't work because the scripture has a clear plan for justice. The first point of justice is restitution, that you make good what you've done wrong but there's a penalty involved in that. So if you steal something from somebody, not only do you have to pay that back again, but you have to pay back the interest. That is what that possession would have earned the person in the time that you stole it. And then a penalty for being a silly person as well. Did they put you in jail? Of course not. What a stupid idea. Who thought up jails? It wasn't God. The only reason to have a jail is to hold someone in remand while they're waiting to be tried for a particularly serious case if they aren't to be bailed on that case. And then the ultimate sanction has to be capital punishment. You remove capital punishment, there's no fear any longer. Apart from that, it's God's instruction, his standard. There comes a time when a person is no longer fit to be part of the society in which we live. Their existence in the society is too much of a risk for that society. And so that's why the scripture prescribes capital punishment for various offences. But it's not popular today, is it? I wonder why that is. See, if man is God... If you put someone to death, it's like killing God, isn't it? I'll let you ponder that. 
So it's not the civil government's role to educate. God has delegated this role to the family and perhaps in some aspects to the church as well. But we we'll, we'll, won't explore that today. Just closing off now. Down the bottom there are some practical issues that we need to be thinking on. Making our way through the minefield of government control is designed to frustrate Christian parents' obedience to the scripture. So it will make it difficult for us to obey the scripture, trying to obey the dictates of the state. That's going to be a conflict that we have to work through and decide where we stand on those various issues. The compulsory schooling legislation is the main issue. It's a relatively recent phenomenon. It's about the 1870s. And when it came in, it was compulsory education. It was that here in Victoria until five, ten years ago. Every other state had compulsory schooling way before that. Now, Victoria has compulsory schooling too. Subtle difference? No, no, no. Significant. Compulsory education implies that you have to satisfy the state that you're doing a reasonable job educating your children. Compulsory schooling is you must send your child to a school that the state has approved. It's a significant difference. In the earlier times of homeschooling in Victoria, you could just say to a government official, I'm not really interested in what you're saying, what demands you're putting on me. If you're not satisfied with the education I'm providing for, your, for my children, then you'll have to do something about it. But I'm going to continue. And if they wanted to do anything, they had to take a summons out against you, call you to court to explain what you were doing for your children. And generally speaking, the magistrates were quite sympathetic if they could see that you're a genuine person, that you had a clear program of education set out, that you knew what you were about and what you were planning to do, they would just say, I don't know why you brought this person here. Please don't bring any more people like this to my court. And so there were very few people that were ever prosecuted in Victoria. Not the same in the other states, because the moment you keep your child home from school, you're breaking the law. Right? That's why... It's been changed to that in Victoria and why your conservative liberal government hasn't changed it back again because they ain't conservative. Excuse the phrase. Okay, number three. Welfare provisions to prevent abuse of children according to the state's standards. Right? We all care about children but not in terms of the standards the state puts on. For example, as your children get older, they need to recognise that they have rights. They need to be told that they have rights and their rights are as against the parents, never against the state. It's always against the parents. So if your 14 or 15 year old child decides they've had enough of you and they want to go somewhere else, they can appeal to the state and they, the state or the school in this particular case will take your child's case against you. And it really doesn't matter what you say, you're the villain because your child has rights. And if your child perceives that you're being unfair, you won't let them watch the right television programs, you won't let them go out when they want to, that's totally unreasonable. And you will be sent to a class to be trained how to manage your child, and if you won't behave at that, they'll take it further. It's diabolical, friends. And it's here in our law today and our children are suffering as a fruit of that. Number four, setting goals for Christian education. National curriculum, for example, is an instrument for the control of the populace. It's got nothing to do with standards of education. Just read the history curriculum, for example. Nothing to do with that at all. It's got to do with promoting what the state thinks is important today. It may change its mind next week, but what it thinks is important today. Will you, will you find in any history course a satisfactory explanation of how this nation was founded in the principles of the word of God? How the governance of this nation was set up on the foundation of biblical principles and we still have them in place today to a significant degree. As quickly as the politicians can change that, they're onto it. Politicians and public servants Living in Canberra, I'm familiar with many of them and how they operate. 
No time for that. Train, number five, training children for service in God's kingdom as opposed to being citizens of the state. The state trains children for independent conformity to society's norms. That's all big words to say. The state wants to train your children so that they can be just like the rest of the people out there in society. That's the political, politically correct values of our day. Christian parents train children to be, to, to be disciples of Jesus Christ who understand the value of obedience. Friends, I can't say this more clearly. The fundamental issue of life is that you were a selfish monster as a result of sin. And when Jesus came to your life, what he changed was to change you from being selfless to, from being selfish to being like him and being selfless. That's the mystery of Jesus. See, Jesus said, I only ever do what the Father tells me. That's obedience. Why? Because the Father and the Son are one. The Father and the Ho Son and the Holy Spirit are one. They, they, they complement one another perfectly. Together they make the Godhead but they are three separate persons in unity, in absolute unity, one with another. And when God draws us to himself, he draws us into the person of God in Christ, who is a trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he makes us like him, in unity, in oneness. It's just so beautiful. But the state hasn't got a clue about that. So all of that which is treasure to us is a monstrosity to them. And as we come into Christ, we come into a place of obedience. What does the state teach? Do your own thing. You're the important person. You do what you want to do. You're a child. You have rights. They're enshrined in the law. You can do whatever you want to do. You can tell your parents to take a running jump and we will back you in that. That is hideous monstrosity in our society. Scripture says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is the first commandment with a promise to honour your mother and father. What's that about? Doing what you're told. Recognising their leadership, their authority that God has given them and your response is to be obedient. It's the key it's the key to life in God. And it's the opposite that the state is trying to inculcate on us and it will always produce a disaster. And lastly, number six, providing social interaction for your children without compromising your biblical standards. And that, friends, is quite a challenge. Who do you let your children interact with? And I've gone over time, but it doesn't matter because I didn't start on time. Who do you let your children interact with? Do you keep them in cotton wool? Do you lock them in their room so they can't be affected by other children out there? Do you let them play with the neighbour's children who might swear occasionally? It's too risky, isn't it? What about the rest of the family? What about the cousins that don't know the Lord? The uncles and aunties? What do you do? How do you make your children, protect your children for the wicked world, from the wicked world out there? It's a huge challenge, isn't it? Let me tell you a secret. One day, when our children were young, um, I decided because my parents weren't Christians that we needed to limit the exposure of our children to my parents. It's very godly, really. I thought I was being particularly spiritual. <laughs> God messes stuff up, you know. And one day I was explaining to God how spiritual I was. And he said, you know... Um, your two children are your parents' only grandchildren. Your children are your parents' grandchildren and they love them dearly. And you're saying, I'm not going to let my children be influenced by my wicked parents. They weren't wicked at all. They were really quite godly people. It's just they didn't know the Lord. They lived by biblical standards. And I just felt terribly challenged because the Lord went on to say, don't you trust me? And I thought, oh, goodness me. I needed to change, you see. 
But the, the trick is, I thought I was doing godly stuff. I thought I was being really spiritual. And yet there was a lack of faith there too. Not, not totally, but just, just enough to spoil the whole thing. And you know, when we, when we changed, the relationship with my parents changed. And ultimately my dad came to know the Lord in the last couple of years of his life. And I'm sure a significant part of that was what God did to me. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Life is never as simple as we'd like it to be. That's why we need to be listening to God all the time and just allowing him to work stuff because otherwise we become legalistic and we say, this is the way it has to be. You can't move from that. But God's world is, is so much bigger and more diverse. And I'm not talking about breaking the standards of the word of God. What I'm saying is there are different applications of them at different times that we need to be sensitive to in the Lord, in our relationship and walk with him. And I know that that's a huge problem. It certainly was a problem for us, and I guess it is for every other Christian parent as they're raising their children. Of course, you don't send your children down to the local brothel to get lessons or something like that. You need to be very careful where you allow your children to go. But by the same token, be careful that you don't develop a total fortress mentality and you won't talk to anybody else. I remember listening to a homeschool guru from America one time saying he wouldn't let his children talk to the children next door because they were heathen. Well, that's okay, and there may be cases where that's appropriate, but you need to be careful before you draw this hard line because sometimes it may, you never know, it may be God's plan to use your children to influence that family to God. It may be that they're the instrument that he plans to use. But you need to monitor it. You need to be careful that it's not having a negative influence on your children and you need to know how to counter that in the same time. So I will go on forever, but I'll stop right about now and we'll have a very short morning tea break and then we're going to come back again shortly afterwards.